It is Monday, April 22nd, 2019, and this is the MMA Hour, donks. Welcome. My name is Luke Thomas. I'm the host of this program. I very much appreciate you joining me today. A lot to get to, as always. A couple of guests coming your way. He was a standout in the wrestling world. Now he's going to be in the UFC, dropping, by the way, down to middleweight. I'm very excited about this man's potential push into the octagon. Well, not really that, but the top of the middleweight division. Deron Wynn will be here at 1 o'clock. Uh, at 1.20, our other guest will be headlining Bellator 220 this coming weekend, looking for the Bellator welterweight strap and to advance in the last leg of the quarterfinals of the welterweight Grand Prix. John Fitch will be here at 1.20. Plus, as always, you'll be my guest, not one, two different ways, using the tweets, hashtag the MMA hour, and, uh, of course, using uh, the phone number. 844-866-2468. We'll get to all that stuff. So, there you go. Okay, hope everyone had a great weekend. Um, I guess I did as well. Your boy's on call for the uh, birth of my daughter here any moment, so we'll see how things go. But uh, I intend to get through the show today. Yes, indeed I do, and I appreciate you guys tuning in. All right, it is time now we kick things off with the YouTube-exclusive portion of our show where we look back this time at UFC St. Petersburg, it's time for the Monday Morning Analyst. All right, here we are, Monday Morning Analyst uh, for this weekend. Not a moment to waste. Now look, man, with these UFC cards that are essentially just designed to be live events in Russia that they just happen to film and share with the rest of the world, like if they didn't share it with you, I don't know if they would be crying about it. It's not really designed for you or for I. It's designed for that part of the world, although, strangely enough, Habib Nurmagomedov complained that it wasn't marketed very well in Russia. Neither here nor there, though. There was a lot of action that was good. There was a lot of action that was not so good. There was something to like on it in a few different places. There was one place in particular, however, that was rather exquisite. That was the co-main event. Islam Makachev taking on, I believe, Arman uh, Saryukian. I could be mispronouncing his name in some capacity or another, although he's Armenian. Shouts to the Armenians. Uh, my mother was one. In any event, the wrestling in that was phenomenal. Um, both ways, actually, but it was much better by Makachev. Although for a debut, uh, Saryukian, by the way, he's got Tsar, Tsar, Caesar, written into his name, which is always kind of interesting and fun. Um, it was good two-way wrestling, but it was much better from Makachev. Now, Makachev has that brutal knockout loss on his career, but you look at his numbers, we're going to go through them in a minute here. He is a very efficient grappler. Saryukian, if he didn't have the ability to strike, trying to wrestle Makachev just was not much of a path to anywhere. He couldn't get far with it. And what I really love about Makachev's wrestling is that it's good, obviously, everywhere, but I guess what I mean to say is it was good defensively, it has good anticipation, it was good mat wrestling. It was more than mat wrestling. And he just had a couple of interesting twists to his game where I'm not sure how much of it is judo. I'm not sure how much of it is sambo. Obviously, sambo and judo themselves have a bit of a shared identity uh, historically from Russia. Uh, by the way, fun factoid, the guy who invented sambo, Stalin killed him for fear of uh, what he might... Well, Stalin was a, um, a paranoid man. So he was murdering, you know, intellectuals and other sort of figures in Russian society. But he had that guy murdered. In any event, um, so there's an interconnectedness between judo and sambo generally. But there's just certain, there's a certain efficiency, a certain smoothness, right? I'm going to have a cup of coffee over here. The hipsters here in Vox Media, they don't even have stevia anymore. They wanted me to put agave, like, you know, nectar or whatever in my coffee. And I said, no, no, I want a smooth pull of coffee. I'm not going to go ahead and do that. Um... I don't know what that story has to do with anything other than to say I really appreciate Makachev. I really appreciate just some of the extra details he was able to use to get ahead. So let's look at some of them now, shall we? All right, there we are. Uh, here is how Makachev got it done. There he is right there. Thank you there, Joe. I appreciate that. Here he is right here. So again, uh, standard disclaimer, and this is going to be especially true here. You know, you're going to catch somebody who wrestled at a high level, and they're going to pick up on stuff that I do do not, uh, that I did not. Um, these are very much, as I've always said, if you know anything about political polling, these are top-line findings. But look at other analysts. These are not the best or the only or the most complete findings. These are my top-line findings. I always encourage you to do your own investigative work and hear what other analysts have to say. 
That being said, these are some things you can look at to help you better understand what Makachev did and what makes him so special, particularly in this contest. Number one, hand control. I wrote hand control. It's a little bit of hand and wrist where he's going for the wrist, but also there's times where he's peeling and controlling the hand. So it's a little bit of both. That's why I kind of put it that way. But it, just to be clear, sometimes it's wrist, sometimes it's hand. This is using as a catch-all. Wrist control is just incredibly important. Remember, go back to my lecture or whatever you want to call these one or two weeks ago. I forget which one it was now. Where we're talking about gripping. Gripping is not just something you do in jiu-jitsu. Gripping is not just something you do in judo. Gripping is not just something that you do in nogi, because there's certain kinds of grips where you can hit an arm drag and things like that. We have to grip up to do it. Gripping is important even in MMA as well. If you can get a hold of somebody, particularly around the hand or the wrist, you just have the ability to control that extremity in certain ways. He does it in all kinds of ways. Defensive wrestling, he does it. He does it for guard passing. He does it to set up foot sweeps. He just has a real command of where to grab the hand and what scenarios and how to control it and how to use it for his benefit. He did it over and over and over and over again. Excellent hand and wrist control from Islam Makachev. Number two, disrupting clinch neutrality. Here is one, he does a couple of things just like Habib. This one is not just like Habib, but in the sense that Habib and Islam Makachev will give you 50-50 in the clinch. Each one will have an underhook, each one will have an overhook. That is ostensibly a neutral position. But with Islam Makachev and with Habib Nurmagomedov, it is not. It is not a neutral position. It is very much not a neutral position. It is very much something that looks neutral, and then they take advantage of the perceived neutrality. The foot sweeps was one of them. It was the main component there. But I just sort of want to show that. Even in situations where Saryukian was looking for a takedown and it looked like it was not really all that close, but kind of close, he would then have these weird attacks from it where there'd be a lull in the action. He's just really, really good about finding these moments where the action kind of stalls, where the position is ostensibly neutral, and they turn it into something that is not neutral at all. He was really good at that. So was Habib Nurmagomedov. The other one is sort of the leg lacing that he does. Not wrestling style leg lacing, but where, remember McGregor was sort of sitting with his legs out against the fence like that in the first his legs are all the way out like that. And then Habib laces them and kind of sits on top of them. He does that as well. Uh, that's not so much the clinch neutrality, but what the two have in common. Three, this was big. Marrying mat wrestling with positional advance. It should be positional advancement. I just didn't want to put another layer down on the text, so it's, I just wrote advance. But suffice to say, you get the idea. It's not merely that he has good wrist control in certain scenarios where he has either cross wrist or same side wrist control. It's that he is always looking to advance position. So he is threatening you not merely with getting dominant control that could be set up to you know, work from turtle. He might be looking to sink the hooks. And if he's not looking to sink the hooks, he's looking to flatten you. And when he's looking to flatten you, he's passing right away. He actually passes much more quickly than Nurmagomedov. He seems to like really moving in advance of that. So it's not just that when he gets you down, he holds you down from a position where he can do, uh, uh, let's say, ground and pound damage. He likes to advance the cause a little bit, and he does it with rapid speed and very, very good technique. It's something you can tell he likes to not... Because think about it. If I take you down, and now I'm in sight... Well, let's say I'm in half guard or full guard, right? When's the best time for me to pass? Probably right away. Because once you get settled into the position, and then you begin to set up your grips, and then you begin to get your hooks in, or whatever you're trying to do if you're playing butterfly guard like Saryukian, then you can begin to do things, and it's going to make passing a little bit harder unless there's a really major big skill differential. The best time to pass is right away, or even in transition. Uh, so he does that, and he does it really well. And then last, never letting his hips turn over. You're going to see a bunch of transitions here. If you notice, there was a lot of time Saryukian was in on his hips, and he could not get, he could not give Makachev down. Why? General rule, of, there's a lot of reasons why, but general rule of thumb, think about it this way. You can't take me down. You can get me to my hands and knees, and you can, get me to a, you can get me to my hands and feet, but you cannot flatten me over unless you get my hips to not face the mat. If my hips face the mat, there's nothing you can do. I'm going to sit in that position. Now, again, you can maybe take the back, and that would create some asymmetry in terms of our offensive options and, and choices. But if my hips never get turned over, that takedown is not going to be there. And Soryukian seems like one of these guys who has a high work rate and likes to get takedowns, but lacks a little finesse in the finishing and lacks a little finesse in the mat wrestling with positional advancement. And that's one of the major reasons why Makachev got ahead. All right, so those are some things to consider. Uh, very quickly, let me look here at his game. Look at these stats here. Again, these are not the best indications of things, 
This is from Fight Metric. This is takedown accuracy. Where is Makachev? He is at number four, if you can see that, with a 71, essentially, can't really quite see that, 71% accuracy in takedown. Now, you'll look at some of these other numbers, and you're going to be like, okay, but Nordin Taleb is number two. Right, but Nordin Taleb and Robbie Lawler, they don't make takedowns a forward, central, a critical part of their game. St. Pierre did. St. Pierre is just ahead of him. So these stats don't tell the full story, but if you're looking at guys, or in this case ladies like Liz Carmouche, for people who make takedowns a central feature of what they do, and they have that kind of success with it, that's really important. And by the way, this is all-time, all-weight classes. Now look at just lightweights. He's got the most efficient takedowns in all lightweights, all time. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. He he is a guy, and, and you can say, well, you got Vince Pichel. Is he you know a top five UFC lightweight? No. And takedowns are a big part of his game, but look who he's fighting. Makachev has not fought the very, very best. I'm just sort of pointing out, I'm not taking it as gospel that he's got the best takedowns at lightweight. It's not what I'm suggesting. I am just trying to argue that there is a lot of reason to believe that his takedowns are particularly efficient, and with a guy with a takedown-heavy style, that tells you a lot. Tells you a lot, because Habib is less than 50. Less than half of Habib's takedowns work. But once he gets you down, and he begins to get in rhythm, obviously it's a nightmare. Okay? All right. So let's look at this. This is this whole sequence here. So this is Saryukian, the Armenian. And then this is uh, Makachev, the Dagestani. I have nothing against him, but, you know, rooting for the guy who uh, shares my mom's ancestry. All right, very quickly here. Um, okay. So, let's watch this. So, this is ostensibly a neutral position, right? One underhook, one overhook. They each share that. Let's go through this and see what happens here. Makachev is pushing into him, and he eats a knee kind of crossways. Punches over from the overhook. And I want to point out something here. Going back to the Tyron Woodley and um, Kamara Usman fight, people are like, why did Mike Goddard intervene? This is why, uh, I'm not sure who was refing here, Herb Dean. He did not intervene in this one because he didn't need to. And he didn't need to because they didn't stay in these positions very long. These guys were constantly level changing. What you saw from Tyron Woodley and Kamaru Usman was they'd get to 50-50 and Kamaru would push him against the fence and then bang on him from the uh, overhook side, which is fine for a little while, but that can't hold you for a minute or two and he would try. When you look at these guys, I want you to pay attention. They get to, they get to ostensibly neutral positions and both are constantly trying to work. That is such a critical difference. Mark Goddard got raked over the coals on that broadcast absolutely unfairly. I can, I will, I can prove it easily that what his, his work there was not only good, it was exemplary. People have this r totally false notion that he did something wrong there. He did not. This is a perfect, among other things, this is a perfect refutation of that because they get to the same positions but they don't last because they're either digging for underhooks or level changing or separating. All the things you need to do to, to keep the referee from intervening. All right? So let's watch this here. He's digging to the body a little bit. You can see that. He's digging to the body. And then Saryuki kind of reaches over with the right hand to maybe block it or whatever. This is all part of the strategy. He's banging on the body. We'll go to the footwork here a little bit later. He's banging on the body. You see that? Look. Bangs on it. Saryuki keeps the hand there throws the punch, and then grabs the wrist. So he's setting up the wrist grab with the ground and pound. What does he want to do? He wants to do a foot sweep. The foot sweeps look like what they're doing is they're just kicking you, and then they're kicking out the post leg. That might be the case in Muay Thai, although even then that's not really true. They're trying to get you to move. What they really want you to do is it's foot sweeps are like overwhelmingly a timing thing. If you've ever tried to do a foot sweep, you know that to be true. It's not really a heavy, bah. I mean, maybe you can take him down that way. That's really not what it is. What it really is is getting somebody in motion and then timing it just right, not with the side of your foot, but with the bottom of the foot, right around the ball of their ankle, and then taking them out. And there's a million different kinds. There's, front, there's the front of the foot. There's the side of the foot. There's inside. There's outside. There's just all different kinds of, of foot sweeps ways to get them past you. You can do it from 50-50, uh, double unders, double overs, 
two on one Russian. You can, I mean, it's a million different ways. This is just his way. So what he's going to do is he bangs on him to the body, grabs the wrist. What he's going to do is he's going to imagine that Saryukian is on a diving board. If you're on a diving board, how far forward do you have to go before you tip over? That's essentially what he's trying to do. He gets him to tip over just enough for his weight to be light. Then he kicks out the post leg, and that is just timing. It's timing. It's beautiful. Yes, he's manipulating the upper body to make him light, and depending on the way he's stepping and everything. But it's I can't stress this enough. That is years and years and years and years and years of practice. That is extremely difficult to do. It's why you don't see them. That takes a special degree of finesse. Even Ben Askren was talking about how good this was and talking about Steve Mako. Steve Mako, the wrestling coach at ATT, wrestler at Oklahoma State, wrestler, uh, no, wait, uh, Iowa, but I think he may have been to both. I can't remember anymore. Um, was on the Olympic team with a bunch of these donks. Um, he is a master at the foot sweep, and he would do it by peeling your face to the side. Not super hard, but just enough to create that turn and that pull, and then he strikes out the bottom right here. So let's watch this. So watch. Saryukian steps back, and I want to pay attention here. This foot kind of oh, that's fine. This foot kind of has to face out like it is, and he's going to switch his stance because you couldn't do it from this. You could have, depending on the footwork, but he's going to switch his stance. It's a little bit better when he does. So he switches his stance, and watch this. He's going to pull. He's going to pull this way, sort of, kind of like rotating down and through, right? Uh, as he's glued his own elbow to his arm like that. He's going to twist just like that. That's going to pull as he's going to watch uh, watch Makachev's hips. See that? His hips come through. So he's pulling him off the diving board, but not all the way. The rest of the work comes from that. You can see it's the bottom of his foot. It's not really the side, and he's right around the ball of the ankle there. That's where it is. And you can look just ever so closely. He's... You can see the weight comes up just a little bit, just a little bit. Look, look closely here. Look at Saryukian's ankle here before Makachev hits it. Comes up just a little bit. You see that? Just a little bit. And he's kind of hitting, he's kind of hitting this direction a little bit. Also hitting this direction. It's sort of a two-way thing. But I want you to pay attention. Look how subtle this timing is. He moves in motion before the weight comes up. He is expecting Saryukian's weight to be lifted by the time the foot makes it. Just look at that. Look at that. So subtle. So subtle. Pow. And then he, he takes him off of his feet. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot stress this enough. That is elite, 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 elite timing. That is brilliant, unmistakable absolutely world-class timing. That is what that is. It's a bunch of other things, but it's timing too. In the words of Vinny Paz, Islam Makachev's out here putting pressure on you kids like he's a soccer mom. All right, here we go. Takes him over, crashes on top of him, which I love, and then just slides over into mount. Presence of mind to do that, marrying the mat wrestling with positional advancement, yeah? And then he goes and holds the spot. So you can with the arm trap, no less. Brilliant, right? So let's keep going here. So a little bit later, so you can get to a side, which is better, better than being flat on your back. What's he going to do? He gets his arm free. He is going to try to use this space here to create a hook to lift to bring the other foot inside. What you're looking for when these guys bring their knees in, you want to get the knee on the inside for the position. If I can get my knee across your belly, then I can fully regard. If I can bring my knee to the inside of your torso, I can better regard. There's much more to it, but that's a big component of it, right? So you see him get sort of two on one here. One is a knee shield. One is the hook. Now he's on. By the way, where is he now? Now he's on an elbow. So think about it before. Flat on his back, now on his side, now on his elbow. He's slowly climbing back to a better position. He extends. Puts the two in. He can't quite get it. Lifts him. Then gets his left knee across. Look here again. Follow this knee. The right knee is going to lift. Both these are going to lift a little bit. And then the left one goes to the side. Right? That's nice work. That's very, very nice work from Saryukian. But Makachev doesn't wait. You see 
Saryuki and tries to lift him. Look how he is posting on his head, ladies and gentlemen. It's another hand if you use it just right. He is posting on the, his right leg, and he is posting on his hand. Oh, excuse me, his head. He's going to be hard to turn. Notice where are his hips facing, ladies and gentlemen. They are facing the mat. They never get turned. They never get turned. So Yuki gets, kind of gets up, and At Makachev passes here, and then he goes to try and be, look at it. And by the way, wrist control, because he wants to come to the back to take the back. Yep, nice work here. Makachev is going to sit. He's going to use his own. He's going to use his own hook to throw him through. I like this from Saryukian. He doesn't accept position. What is he going to do? Where are his hips facing? The mat. Hips facing the mat. Hips facing the mat. And uh, now Makachev has to bail, which I thought was really nice work from Saryukian. I just wanted to put that in there. Yep. He gets up. And that's that. All right, here we are a little bit, just a little bit later. Let's watch what happens here. This is, looks like it's small. I want you to point something. I mentioned hand and, hit and hit control. Go back here a little bit. Look, he's got, he could almost have a takedown and a uh, guillotine jump if he wanted to do it. And then we look, this is two, 219. Now we're at 207. Makachev gets a hand inside and pries it free and then goes to grab right there. Always fighting the hands. Always. Always fighting the hands. And then he pops his head out. See that? Constantly fighting the hands, offensively and defensively. And then he works here. Okay, so here we are at 140. He's going to pop him. This is just amazing presence of mind by Saryukian. He goes to turn. Now, he might have gotten his takedown but for the fence. But look at Makachev. Hand posted, hips facing the mat, right? Watch. He just can't turn him over. His hips are facing the mat. Cannot turn this guy over. And then he comes back around. Uh, here we are. By the way, he, so he has his back. He gets his left arm now pried sort of in between like that, lifting a little bit. Right? And then he's got bicep control on the other side. Now he's got an overhook, and, an, and he's got bicep control. So Aryukian tries to lift and turn here. So he's going to rotate him. So Aryukian is rotating this way, yeah? Look at Makachev. Plants the hand. Look at his hips. They're almost getting turned over. They're almost getting turned over, but his hand and his elbow and his whizzer is enabling him to, to twist over. Saryukian decides to go for the back, which the whizzer kind of prevents. Now you see uh, Makachev wants to twist into him, but if he does, and he does, he's going to get taken back because now he can just drive this angle and drive him flat, but... He almost gets taken down again, and then he just bails back. He never, and look where his hips are facing. He never lets his hips get turned over, ever. It's just really, really super solid work. Let's keep going here. All right, he stands. He's going to use this hook. Saryukian loves to use his hooks to turn him over, and then he wants to keep control. And you're going to watch, you're going to watch him, uh, Islam, sit out, and then he could, probably could have turned in there but decided not to, and then he stands. And then watch again, grabbing the hand here, and then he's going to use the same sweep, same kind of timing, but you notice his weight really isn't in motion that much, so he gets turned, but he doesn't get thrown. All right, real quickly, let's go to the second round. Here he is from a front headlock. I love this from, from, uh, from Saryukian. This was just so epic. Basically, what he's going to do is he's going to bring his head to the other side. Typically, you want to grab on this elbow and pull it across. And then this hand now allows you to come around the side. Watch. So, you see that? He can't quite get over. But now, let's see. Let's watch. He's going to bring his head up. He has to get it to the right side of Makachev's body. Let's see. Brings his weight down, pulls his head out, and then comes out the side. Typically, you want to pull on this elbow. I don't think Saryukin needed to do it because it got a little loose in transition. Yeah, you can see it gets a little loose here. But he brings that out over the top and pops it free. Love that. Boom. Nice shot on the exit. Saryukin was a worthy adversary. Here we are, and i got to wrap up with this here. I love this. He tries to take the back, but the arm beats him. He can't quite do it. Again, looks like a neutral position. Boom. Again, look at him. Watch... Watch this. 
His feet are already lifted by the time Makachev hits it. Now, he doesn't quite finish the turn, so Saryukian is able to get his hips down. But look at this. All it was was a transition to a single leg attempt. Kick out, pop through, bang, and then just drive like that. Just super nice work, man. Not every foot sweep is going to be a full takedown, but if it can transition to the next one and you can chain them together, it's just brilliant work. Really, really solid stuff from Islam Makachev. And then he runs the he goes to a head outside single um, by Saryuki and then decides. So he runs the pipe, right? Pump sits him and then goes the other way. So I want you to pay attention here. He's rotating this way and then decides to rotate this way. Hot like that, keeping keeping that constantly changing directions on you, yeah. And then uh, he went for this Kimura. I don't like going for Kimuras for stuff like this. And I'm going to show you why this didn't work. He runs him down. Saryukian's hips are they facing the mat? Nope, they're facing up. Right. I don't like this one because he can put his hands together. I mean, far be it for me to critique a guy who's in the UFC and I'm not. But I'm just telling you personally. This is just my my opinion. I don't like this, and I'll tell you why I don't like this. Because here, this is kind of strong, and you'll see why it's not in a minute. Makachev just brings his hips over to block it, because now he can't create space away from his body. right? Here's why I don't like it, because we'll fast forward here just a little bit. He gets at a perpendicular angle to him, and he drives his weight into him. I want you to pay, pay attention to this. Look at the distance between the elbow and the chest of Saryukian. It's far away. you got to bring that thing. You, you don't always have to, but like a general rule of thumb, that needs to be up here. It needs to be nice and tight and compact so you're using your whole body to turn. Saryukian's arms versus Makachev's weight and base, he's never going to win. He's never going to win. So you can't really do that. So here we are. He tries to scoot his hips out a little bit and then bring the elbow close to him, but he can't because it's blocked. He eventually bails on it. Now he goes from an elbow to a hand to get up. And Makachev puts him back down, immediately goes for the pass, step through, lays flat. Let's see how he, does he get it? No. Good work here. But there he is. He goes for it again. So he's just going to lay Saryuki in flat on one hip and then bring his hip over the, look at his, follow this leg. He's just going to lay him flat so his hips go this way. And then he's just going to bring it over the top like that. Nice work. Now he didn't control the head. So Saryuki and squirmy underneath, but I want you to pay attention. What did he grab? In all scenarios, grabbing the wrist. In all scenarios, all the time. He's so good at it. Saryuki and had to was going for the head inside single a lot and had a lot of trouble getting it. You can't quite tell, but anybody who's wrestled will, prob will probably say this is true. I can't imagine that they would disagree with this part. There's so much daylight between his chest and the thigh. For a head inside single, King Mo one time showed me how he does his head inside singles. And King Mo was making a point about how much weight has to be on the top of the thigh and the head has to be kind of guiding the hips. And it's just nowhere close. He has his hips back. The head is kind of stacked underneath. There's space between the chest and the hips. There's just not enough to get this done. And Makachev knows it. So he just sort of fights the hands. And, uh, and by the way, he didn't wrestle through him. He wrestled to him. So he kind of gets flat here and then tries to stand, it just doesn't work that way. Not, not, not very successfully, right? And then you see Makachev just break all this up. Boom. Nice shot from him. Goes to the other side. Here's another shot. Sar Saryukian's in on the right leg. I'm going to wrap up here pretty quickly. He goes to get to the back. Saryukian blocks it by grabbing this leg. But the problem is now, look at the wrist control that Makachev has. He's going to fold him backwards, almost like a crucifix. Saryukian just kind of bails and athletically gets back to his base. But that was a perilous, perilous moment there. And they get up and they stand. I'm almost done here. End of the fight. I want you to watch this. He's going to get underneath him. Boom. Where are, whose hips are facing where? Saryukian tries to roll. This is so good from Islam Makachev. Hand is planted, head is planted. So his balance should be good. And he just guides. He goes past this hook from... Saryukian, and then goes into what's called leg drag. This is a leg drag position. He could easily move into a lot of different spaces here. Uh, well, it's not quite leg drag because this leg is in front. It's like a half leg drag, but he floats essentially. Yeah, it's not quite leg drag. I don't want to misstate it. Um, but it's close to leg drag, and then he's 
folded his hips to the side, and he has sat on top of this hook. Now, all he has to do is lift his leg, and he would get to leg drag. But I just love how he floated. Now he can leg weave past it if he wants. Saryukian got the inside position on the knee, but it was a pretty nice job by both these guys. You can put the thumbnail back up. You get the idea. It's just super solid work. I'm not telling you he's the best lightweight. I'm not telling you he's got the best wrestling in the UFC. I'm not telling you any of that. What I am telling you is, if you look at some of the details from the hand control to the timing on the foot sweeps to the positional advancement and to some of the other small things, the way he sets it all up, that's a bad, bad dude. Islam Makachev, I know he had that one brutal knockout loss, but he appears to be a standout in that UFC lightweight division for a very good reason. And that is my Monday morning analyst. All right, let's do this. Oh, yeah. All right, so what we'll do is, as I put my... People like treat Splenda like it's rat poison. It's not rat poison, y'all. It's good. Well, I don't know if it's good, but it's not rat poison. Oh, you're going to get, you're going to get, you know, you're going to get AIDS from eating Splenda. No, I'm not. I'm going to be just fine. Don't you worry about me. And by the way, yes, if I had better coffee, I wouldn't even necessarily need a sweetener, but you, know, you got to, sometimes you got to make a lemonade out of lemons, y'all. All right, let's try this joker. Edible. All right, so what we'll do now is we'll do some calls. Uh, as always, the number to call, 844-866-2468. If we don't finish all of them here, we can do them a little bit more at the end of the show. We can stitch them all together. Um, but I'm told that the calls were good, even though it was a bit of a lighter weekend in MMA, man. There wasn't a whole lot going on. It was, it was a little bit shallow, if I do say so myself. So um, happy to have a bit of a weekend off in terms of that, but it does create some problems when you're trying to generate user content. Are we ready to rock? Uh, all right, time now for the sound off. All right, let's go to my friend, Danny Segura. There he is. Hey, buddy, how are you? I'm good. You got to put uh, honey in your coffee, man. That's that's the way to roll. Yeah, I don't think that's an improvement. You put honey in tea. Coffee as well, for sure. That is gross. That is, it's the best. It's delicious. It's all natural, my friend. Yeah. That's but, Splenda, man. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, show me the study of where Splenda causes health problems. I'm sure I can Google something and you, uh, you send you a few articles your way. People, this is the same thing that happens with my PED debates. Yeah. Right, this, here's what I'll do. I will make a claim, an evidentiary claim based on a study or a book or a paper I have written, uh -huh. or not, excuse me, I've written, read. Yeah. And then people respond with their amateur game theory. I'll be like, oh, here are the facts of the case as determined by the best estimates and the best public experts that we have. And people go, well, that can't be true because people just don't act that way. Right. Uh -huh. Your amateur game theory isn't a challenge for the facts. There are some artificial sweeteners that could be bad for certain women in certain stages of their lives. Uh, but this idea that, like, I'm going to get some kind of major health problem from moderate use of Splenda is, my friend, I hate to tell you, not real. Sorry, but Splenda. Well, enjoy your bad coffee. All right. How were the calls? The calls were good, man. Um, they were, you know, interesting. No, most of them were unrelated to UFC St. Petersburg. So I really, really wonder how many people watched that event. Yeah, I guess not many. But um, yeah, the calls were pretty decent. I did have to scrape the barrel a little bit. But, uh, you know, I found I found a good amount. All right. I'm glad you're admitting you had to scrape the barrel. That's always good for show morale. Yeah, of course. You know, I mean, after our Splenda honey debate. All right. You know? Let's do this. All right. Well, let's talk about Islam Makhachev. You just, you know, broke down his fight on the morning, Monday morning analyst. I feel like he was the biggest winner on the card. Easily. Hey, Luke. My name is Abir Aman. I'm calling from Northern Virginia. And I just want to talk about the Islam Makhachev fight over the weekend. I feel like he showed great grappling, wrestling skills, although his opponent was tougher than many would have thought. Where do you think you're going from here? Because if you look at him and Khabib, their wrestling style, the way they hold people down is pretty similar, and they use a lot of the same techniques. Do you think in a few years he can maybe become the lightweight champion after it could be maybe hangs it up or moves up? And also, his striking might be a little bit better than Khabib's was at this stage or even right now. But do you think he has the potential to become the lightweight champion in the future? Thanks. I have no idea. Uh, until he fights 
more ranked and known. Yep. Saryukian obviously is talented. Yes. But we just don't know how good he is. Without there's not there's just not enough information to say. Right, right, right. Um, until he fights better opposition, I couldn't tell you that. But as I mentioned, there are just as you can see, there are certain positions he gets to that are and certain act, um, attacks that he has that are just very like you have to have a very high level of skill to do. But he has been brutally KO'd before. So, you know, I don't know. It, once. Once. Once is enough. Oh, that's true. It's more than Habib. Now, Habib might be the, be the best fighter on the planet. I'm just pointing out, can he be the champion? Maybe. Let's see him fight a top 15 guy. He's also still pretty young. You know, he's uh, he's 27. So Yeah. You know. Here's the answer. I have no idea. We have to see yeah. him against better opposition. Yeah. Who'd you, th- you you would agree, though, he definitely deserves a top 15 next. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. He's too good to be fighting exactly. unranked guys at this I point. I feel like he's been doing that for quite a bit. I mean, he got some nice names as far as, like, veterans, Glacian Tebow, right? Nick Lentz. Um, but, man, it's, it's time to get a, a ranked opponent. Uh I don't know. I'd like to see. I don't know if Gregor Gillespie has his hands full right now. I don't know if he's booked for any fight, but that fight could be fun. Yeah, he's beaten Little Sambo versus uh, American wrestling. He's beaten Chris Wade, Nick Lentz, Gleason Tebow, Cajun Johnson, and now Armin Saryukian. Yeah, he is due a ranked opponent. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, get him a top fifteen. All right. With that, um, with that out of the way, let's move on to the light heavyweight division and, and talk about a, a certain fellow. All right. Hey, Luke. Hey, Danny. This is Justin calling from Salem, Massachusetts. And I was just wondering, um, what do you guys think? I feel like Luke Rockhold moving to 205 is really flying under the radar. I mean, this is a guy that we want to there as one of the greatest pound-for-pound fighters in the world after he defeated Chris Weidman back at UFC. I forget which number it was. But, again, I feel like he's, this move is really flying under the radar. And if he could pick up the W and look impressive against uh, Jan Vlachowicz, uh, Im- impressively, of course, and uh, – for whatever reason, talk himself into the title fight who's saying with John Jones, if John, of course, gets past Thiago this July. Uh, can you foresee uh, Luke being the person, the guy to dethrone John at 205? Um, I would love to get your thoughts about this, Luke. I appreciate it. And uh, your Monday Morning Analyst is one of my favorite pieces of television all week. So I appreciate it, guys. Keep up the great work. Talk to you soon. All right. All right. Well, smart man if he likes the Monday Morning Analyst. Who doesn't? Yeah. Um, Probably a lot of people. Uh, all right, so are we are we sleeping on uh, Luke Rockhold? I like how I had I had Luke Rockhold on the show last week. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Uh, I don't feel like anyone people like he's really flying yeah. under the radar. Yeah, thanks guys. I had him on the show last week. I uh, do. I do have to say, I feel like there is a uh, a trainer thought out there that he doesn't pose much of a threat to John Jones. I feel like you know people. I mean, from what I see on Twitter, not what I believe. There absolutely has been a drop in Luke Rockhold's stock by yeah. virtue of the way he was losing and the amount of times he lost mm-hmm. at the end at middleweight. Here's what I would say. For all the stock that his has dropped, that could rebound just as fast. Now, maybe not necessarily against Jan Blahovich, although it depends, I guess, how the fight goes. Yes. But if he shows that, number one, he is much more resilient physically and durable at 205, that would change a lot. If he looks like he's got boundless energy... That would change a lot. If he, by the way, can keep a consistent schedule, he's had a lot of injuries at 185 pounds. That would change a lot. So can he be the guy to dethrone? Again, you're asking questions about a guy who, yes, we know well, dot, 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 Danny, in another division under very different physical circumstances. Yeah. we got to see how all that changes him. Or maybe it doesn't change him. We don't know. We'll find out. But I I do think um, people are sleeping in his move to 205 a little bit. I think, you know, Remember who gave John Jones the most trouble? Like some of the people, obviously Alexander Gustafson, but people forget the Bitor Belfort fight, and that was that was from guard. That was John got in trouble from having Bitor, uh, from being in Bitor's guard. And we know that Luke Rockhold has an amazing guard, and you know if anybody can snatch an arm, it would be him. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm really curious to see how he looks. And look, if if he manages to, you know be able to absorb punishment a little better at 205 dude he's a real threat you know and he was not a weak hitter at all at 185 yeah. and nah. he's out there lifting yeah, yeah. weights now at 205 yeah i wonder what that might do for him so just like uh, here are, are, if the, also he has the frame of of a light heavyweight this isn't like aoa romero who's you know a shorter guy moving up a division you go okay yeah like he's probably gonna have an easier cut but you know he's still at least height wise he's still you know fairly fairly small for that division yeah. luke rockhold it looks like a natural 205 he does and um if you're asking me, am I highly intrigued by a potential move to light heavyweight for Luke Rockhold? The answer is quite obviously yes. Yeah. Long time overdue. I wonder the same yes. thing about Chris Weidman. Uh, I don't know that to be a fact for him. I'm just saying. 
Yeah. Yeah. I do wonder. I absolutely wonder. I think it's the right choice. And again, I can't predict success, but if success finds him in the ways that we think it might, it certainly is a, a bit of a game changer. Also promotionally, like it's a good move too. Cause like, I mean, the Anthony Smith fight, like, you know, nonetheless is John Jones, one of the greatest, you know, it's still, it's still a big fight, but it doesn't, it didn't have that big fight feel. And I, I don't think the Tiago Santos is going to give me that big fight feel. Um, but I think if Luke Rockhold gets to a position where he fights John Jones, it, it, I think that will definitely have a big fight feel. Okay. Um, you know, given the fact that obviously he's a former champion in Strike Force and the UFC as well. Sure. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about uh, International Fight Week. Hey, Luke and Danny. This is Nino from Washington Township, New Jersey. I just had a question for you. Nino Brown. With all the good fights that are coming up on this International Fight Week card, I was just wondering. What fight excites you the most and why? Thank you. Love listening to your show. Happy Easter, man. What a nice question. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we're assuming this is UFC 239, correct? Yes. All right, so here is the card for UFC 239 as we understand it today. John Jones fights Tiago Santos, then Nunez home, and Ganu versus Dos Santos. That's a sleeper on that card, bro. Yep. As you indicated, Blahovich versus Rockhold. Edmund Shabazian, shouts to Armenia, taking on Jack Marshman, Diego Sanchez, taking on Michael Chiesa, and then Jorge Masvidal, Ben Askren. Candidly, I will tell you, probably my number one um, is either the main event or Askren Masvidal. What about you? I, I like the main event, um, but, you know, I think for me is is definitely Askren Masvidal because I think the winner there will most likely end up fighting for the belt. Um, you know, there's a few factors still floating around. We will see how, how Tyron Woodley looks against Robbie Lawler, right? But I think that fight right there is, is pretty key for that division. And, you know, also Amanda Nunes versus Holly Holm. I think that's a fantastic bout. I know some people are hating on it because they feel like um, um Holly Holm is not deserving of a shot. But stylistically, like, that's going to be fun. That's going to be a fun fight. You know, it's interesting. Uh, let's say Ben Askren wins. I don't know yeah. that he will, but let's posit a scenario where he does. That won't be as monumental as allowing women into the UFC. That's a much bigger deal, obviously. Um, you know, literally many divisions, you know, right, dozens right. and dozens of participants. But when you think back about a like a got like a cataclysmically indefensible decision, if if yeah. Askren wins that, it's one of them. And you're like, yeah. this is the guy that you kept out since 2013 that you told to go get experience at World. Like how? ill-advised and utterly indefensible would his decision yeah. be if Askren shows up and starts beating UFC welterweights in the way that he potentially could. It would be one of the biggest egg-on-your-faces moments in sure. uh, in UFC corporate history. For sure, yeah. We'll, we'll see what happens. That's, that's a tough fight, too. And, or, or Jorge goes in there and yeah. smokes him. I don't Dude, know. And Masvidal also. Like, talk about, like, you know, we just saw Dustin Poirier win the title, like, recently, right? Masvidal will be one of those guys as well, a guy that's been there and has been grinding sure. for forever, and he's finally, like, putting everything together. I'm merely positing a scenario, not yeah, making yeah. a prediction. All right. Um, let's move on. Also, uh, that Ngannou Dos Santos fight is going to be That's fun. a sleeper, yeah, dude. I don't hear a lot of talk about it, but it's a baller, baller fight, man. Yeah, it is, man. And especially because DC will probably, you know, he has one fight and will probably be done after that. So the winner here, you know, could potentially be... Contesting Hold on, dude. I got to think for my wife here. Hang on. Please don't tell me. She's going into labor. Fuck's sake. No. Okay. Sorry. I'm all right. I'm all right. Jesus. You scared me there. She had, she, well, she sent me five messages, and I'm like, yeah. oh, here we go. Right as I'm on the air. No, no. Yeah. I'm all right. Right in the middle of something. Yeah. Plus, uh, her brother is there. So we're, I think okay. we're okay. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Woo. Okay. All right, let's talk about a fight going on uh, this weekend, I believe, right? right? Yep. In my hometown. Hey, Luke and Danny. This is Alex calling from Orlando, Florida. Um, so, Luke, I always really enjoy your breakdowns and analysis of fights. Uh, and with that being said, I want to get your take on how you think the Jacare Souza and uh, Jack Hermanson fight is going to play out this upcoming weekend at uh, UFC Fort Lauderdale. And do you think that Jack Hermanson has the ability to be a top contender in the middleweight division? Thanks. Appreciate your time. Well, it's an interesting bout because Hermanson believes he has the best ground and pound in the UFC. Uh, yeah. I don't know if that's true, but he certainly has made that claim. He made that claim previously as well as on this show. Yeah. Yeah. And Jacare, as we all know, has had one of the best ground games in the UFC for years, in MMA for years. Yep. So, but he also can strike on the feet. So, what I'm looking for is I, I'll be honest, I think Jacare is going to win. 
mm-hmm. but I, I don't do like predictions anymore in large part because I don't, I'm not very good at them, but also because, um, sometimes these guys take growth jumps, Danny, you've seen it yeah. where someone just, you think one thing about them and then you see them in a big fight. You're like, okay, they, they leveled up here and you didn't know it until you saw it. So this is a level up opportunity for Jack Hermanson. I'm not saying he can't win. My hunch is that Jacare is the Jacare is just more known. Yeah. So Jacare could probably beat him standing. He's physical enough to match him. So what I'm looking for is, can Hermanson avoid a sub or a big punch, take him down, and then use his cardio and uh, relative youth, and probably probably does have a strength advantage uh, on the ground later. Because if you can ground and pound Jacare, buddy, you are doing something right. He's going to have yeah. instinctual defense even when he's hurt for a long time. So that's going to be a tall order. So this is why I'm a little bit skeptical of, of his chances, but I could very much be wrong. And honestly, I w- I, he seems like a great guy. Yeah. Did the best man win. Yeah. That's going to be a fun fight. I was super impressed when he submitted uh, David Branch. David Branch, I believe he's a Henso Gracie black belt. Yes. Uh, dude. And David has been one for a long time. Legit, yes, dude. he yeah, is. He's a legit grappler, man. Um, and you know, getting that type of submission the way he did, it, it's super impressive. And Jacare, dude, he's another, he's one of the best grapplers to ever step in the octagon. So, uh, I'm, I'm really curious to see how it plays out. I do, I do gotta say Jacare has had a lot of wear and tear throughout his career. Uh, Hermanson seems to be like the fresher fighter. I don't know if you agree with that. Yes. Um, Although he's coming off the back to back thingy, but yeah. Yeah, that's true. But I mean, it, it was a quick fight. So, eh. but, uh, we'll see, man. But I mean, I think if, if Hermanson gets past Jacare, man, he's gonna, turn a huge corner in his career and all of a sudden he's he's a title contender in that uh division yeah sure absolutely i mean you can't get a win over jack ray and not be a contender you know what i'm saying yeah so all right let's talk about tj dillashaw people still have questions about him wow what's up docs michael from fresno calling um about the ped issues in 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 mma really i just want to hear um, comments if uh, there if you perceive there are any correlations between uh, TJ Dillashaw's um, EPO use and the decline of the Henry Morrow and Cody Garbrandt's uh, career at, at, at these current points. Thank you. So I just want to say, um, Usada actually went back because I feel like this flew under the radar. Usada actually went back and tested. Um, the samples for TJ Dillashaw samples when he fought Cody Garbrandt. And I think all the samples that uh, he gave throughout the the time that the UFC had the partnership with USADA, and they mm-hmm. came back clean from, from EPO. Which doesn't mean he wasn't using it. Exactly, because it could be – EPO apparently has a, a very short uh, half-life, so it can go away quite quick. Um, but still, I mean, we don't know, you know? So we, we, can't, we can't attribute – What do you uh, think? What's your hunch? What's your gut tell you? I mean, we, we don't know, so I, I, I can't assume, but, like, I, I do have to say, you know, that was his style, man. And, and we do, like, also, Henry Burrell's decline can, can – we know he also had really tough weight cuts yeah, as well. He murdered himself. Yeah, that was yeah, the thing yeah. with Hendricks, too. Everyone's like, I oh, mean, you saw that. He got a canceled Hendrix. fight with TJ Dillashaw because of the weight cut. Right. Didn't he, like, slip and hit his head on the song yeah. or something so, like that? And also, yeah. they, Johnny, people thought Johnny Hendricks was using. I talked to him about it to his yeah. face. Um, but And maybe that was true. But here's what we know was true. He yeah. murdered himself with weight cuts. He absolutely yeah, destroyed he himself. So that was a big component as well. I mean, look, people, again, I've got unorthodox views on this. The answer is probably, maybe, uh, you yeah. know, if you want to believe that, um, or that he should be reasonably culpable about it or for yes. it, that's fine. And also, I got to say, like, Garbrandt's decline is not really attached to physically how he looked, because Baral clearly, like, you saw a different fighter. In yeah, he looked, this guy was he looked not moving the same. Yeah. And he wasn't taking the same damage. Uh, or didn't have the ability to take the same damage. While Garbrandt, like, the f- first few minutes of that Munoz fight, like, he was looking good, man. It was all until, you know. He got hit until whatever. Yeah. But here's the exactly. thing. People are like, oh, Garbrandt's decline. Um, point of order. I don't think Garbrandt's decline is permanent. Yeah. And I think it is very reversible. Yes. He does not in any way, shape, or form. He's not in the same place Barrage. No. He does but, not. Yeah. And by the way, he's in his 20s. What is he, 28, yeah. 29? So, mm-hmm. Something like that. Cody Garbrandt, this idea that we're going to bury, I'm not saying the caller was, but I've seen yeah, some yeah, people yeah. being like, oh, Cody's declined. Yeah. Um, again, point of order, whatever troubles he's experiencing, these are very correctable ones. Okay. He has been knocked out a couple of times. That's not great. Um, or a few times at this point. Yeah. However, uh, I don't think that his chin is gone because he had some issues in the amateurs when he was fighting this way. Yeah. And 
he even acknowledged on Twitter yeah, yeah. part of his problem to yeah. quote Cody Garbrandt was he was fighting like a dumbass. Yeah. Uh, I have, I am a big believer in Cody Garbrandt. I have mm-hmm. seen the uppermost of his abilities. He is very talented. Now, whether he will get back there, I don't know. I am utterly unprepared to bury him. I am yeah. not going to do it. Not now, certainly until there's much more evidence. I am in fact, anticipating something of a comeback to be candid with you. That's sort of my, where my heart is at on this one. Also, you know, let's be honest. There's been turmoil at uh, Team Alpha. You know, I, believe, I believe it's called Alpha MMA now. Yeah, I believe that because um, they got a bunch of women there. Because, you, know. you know, they got they switched coaches. You know, Cody Garbrandt went through the Dwayne, uh, Dwayne era, right? Mm-hmm. Then uh, we know that then, um, man, I'm forgetting his name. Um, oh, he also left as well. No, no, no. Um, after him. Buckles? Buckles. Yeah, yeah. He was also big into his his – his whole development as a fighter as well, and he left. So, you know, there's a lot of variables. So I, I wouldn't agree with this caller. I think maybe there is something to be said about TJ Dillashaw's uh, EPO usage and, and their decline, but I think there's so many other factors that attribute to to the slump that these two other fighters are going. So here's the one question I would have for everybody. I, again, I've got unorthodox opinions, but it's something you should confront. Yeah. And it's something you should have an answer for, right? I, this is the basic belief that I have. If someone says, Luke, do you think EPO is a performance-enhancing drug? It is quite clearly... Yes, a performance enhancing drug. Here's one thing, though, that you have to kind of acknowledge. Um, knockouts and TKOs since USADA has been introduced have not declined. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a question of as a entertainment sport, whether you would want them to. Right. But at, on aggregate, is there less damage being done since the introduction of USADA to the physical bodies of UFC fighters? This is not me making it up. And again, I don't want to hear anyone's amateur game theory. I want you to confront the facts. There is no evidence that the UFC is in any way safer on aggregate by virtue of USADA's introduction. You can make a claim, Danny, and I wouldn't fight you on it, that perhaps TJ heaped on extra punishment or maybe the stuff that he wouldn't have done but for these other factors. No one really knows, but certainly I can't dispute that. It is what it is. Here's what you can or here's what you also can't dispute. You're getting just as many knockouts. You're getting just as much trauma. It hasn't declined even a little bit. So this idea that by taking on the most rigorous, if still flawed, drug testing system has resulted in a safer sport, maybe in the sense of trying to work through the challenges of um, one thing I think I will credit Jeff Nowitzki is, is trying to raise awareness about the challenges of uh, weight cutting. Yeah. Right. I think that that's got as a culture, we've gotten a little bit better about it, certainly than the old days. Uh, but the reality is, it's there is look at me. There is no safe way to fight. There's there's it's not possible. The, the, it is by definition assault. It is what you are doing, and so therefore you have to ask yourself: How is it you can introduce rigorous drug testing and not have a drop off in trauma? That should tell you something, and you should have an answer for it. Now, whatever that answer might be, I leave up to you. But this idea that like we're not hitting uh, baseballs or footballs, this is. This is two by people, right? Well, why hasn't the violence declined? Anyway, and also, by the way, you also have another sport that has even worse health outcomes, like American football, than you do in MMA, and they don't have hardly any PED testing policy, and no one over there cares. Also, a bit of a contradiction. I know everyone's going to downvote this, and they're going to hate on me. <laughs> I don't care. They, here, again, here's what they're going to do. Here's exactly what they're going to do, Danny. I'm going to bring up these terribly, um, uh, what, what, what do you want to call? Not merely inconsiderate. Terribly unfortunate for the narrative nonsense that they've been fed for 30, 40, 50 years, and they're, and they're going to give me amateur game theory rather than responding to what the facts on the ground are. Just want to point that out. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. All right. I'm going to get um, Darren Wynn, but uh, do, uh, by the way, are you an Aven- Avengers fan by any chance? Uh, you mean, I, I guess the movies. I didn't read the comic yeah, books. Yeah, the movies. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to leave you with this question because I – I've probably seen the movies, but I oh yeah, you too cool them. for school? Is that what you are? Yeah, I'm too cool for superheroes, dude. <laughs> I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just not a big fan of like superhero movies. Um, although the Dark Knight series were good, but I um, mean, I'll watch them occasionally. You, sorry, but, before you go, did you see Infinity War, the last Avengers one? I think so, but I can't remember. How man. do you not know? Is that does Hulk grab some dude and just start smashing him around? No, Infinity War was when Thanos beat the balls off of Hulk. Oh no, 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 I didn't see. That's that. the best one, dude. Yeah, well, you sicken me. <laughs> you sicken me. Uh, yeah, all right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave you with this call. All right. All right, let's do it. You carry a team with this one. Hi, Luke. It's Quinn from Sacramento. I don't have any uh, MMA related questions uh, this time, but I am curious 
uh, how amped, how excited for you are you for Avengers Endgame? Are there any specific payoffs you want to see? Do you want to see Captain America lift Thor's hammer? You know, just what are you looking forward to? How amped are you? And uh, thanks. I love the show. Uh, every Monday, man. Luke Thomas in the morning. Thank you. Have a good day. Hey, there we go. Well, what a very nice question. I really appreciate it. The answer is I'm unbelievably pumped for it. I thought that um, was a Josh Brolin who played Thanos, I believe, the last time. In any event, I uh, thought he did an unbelievably great job. I thought the ne- the weaving of the narratives... Uh, essentially, Infinity War was just a bunch of different movies all kind of taking place simultaneously, I think four or five stories at once. I was surprised at how central Guardians of the Galaxy was to that story. But each of those, if you've never watched the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Spider-Man has a certain feel, Thor has a feel, Captain America, Iron Man, Guardians of the Galaxy, Hulk, they all have got their own different feels. And they kind of made a way to, uh, Black Panther, they all found a way to make it work together in a very, very ingenious, smart, deft you know, look, it's not Akira Kurosawa, but for a fun action movie, I thought they did a really great job. Yeah, I'm very excited. I'm very excited. I mean, I've got a couple ideas about what they're going to do with Doctor um, Doctor Strange going back in time, but you know, I don't know if the I don't know if that part of the Infinity Stone is going to be available to them. I, I don't know. I don't know. I have a lot of. So what do I want to see? I want to see Thor. I want to see Thor take Thanos because that was sort of like his mandate. Um. I want to see some characters permanently die. If you're going to have this kind of a switch and the end of an era, which they claim this to be, you know, some of these Bamas can't come back. Some of them have to stay gone. So I don't know who that's going to be, but it should be some of them. Um, And I'm looking for some surprises. I'm looking for some surprises. I want to see some other villains too. All right, let's go to this gentleman now. Stud wrestler. And uh, he was a coach on The Ultimate Fighter. He's an AKA member and a whole lot more. He joins us now via the magic of Skype. My friend and yours, the one and only Duran Wynn. Hi, Duran. What's up, Luke? How are you, buddy? I'm doing well. Am I pronouncing your name, your first name correctly? Duran, right? I know. I was going to tell your boy that that hooked us up. Yeah, he said Darren, but dude, I uh, I've been used to that my entire life. Uh, People call me Darren. So uh, I, I correct the majority of people, but sometimes I don't find it necessary. I don't correct them. But, uh, yeah, it's Duran, bro. All right. Let's get to it right away. Um, first of all, correct me if I'm wrong. Were the were, were the Pan Am games over the weekend in wrestling? Yeah, yeah, man. We did really well. We actually won. For every single weight, we won all gold medals, man. It was crazy. Has that happened before? I, I, I'd have to check, but I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it did happen before, but uh, I've never seen it happen before. You know what's crazy is they didn't send all their number ones either. Like there was a bunch of, there was kind of a couple ways where it was just a random villain. That's just how good we are as a country these days. Uh, very good. Now, there's a bunch of questions I have about that, but let me get to the first one. We have spoken before, although first time that you and I are speaking on this show. Um, you have been signed by the UFC. You have your first fight set up. What took so long? Um, a lot of things going on behind the scenes. Um, you know, I, I, I don't want to say too much, but uh, uh, like me and DC, we're going to fight on the same card uh, to begin with. And uh, some, some, some things came up and DC couldn't fight right away. So uh, we kind of had to figure out what card would, would work best for me and what made sense. And then even, even with this, uh, we actually had, uh, you know, more than four or five guys declined the fight. So, oh, um, oh really? I, uh, uh, so, yeah. So even in the UFC, man, I had guys uh, turn down the fight to me. So, uh, which is really surprising. But the good thing is, is uh, Nick uh, did a good job at uh, uh, finding uh, obviously a new opponent. And we actually had, I was, I thought we had a uh, uh, one lined up that Anthony Hernandez. And then for some reason he pulled out last minute, and uh, I thought that was going to be it. And then literally like the next day, Nick uh, Nick found uh, Marcus Perez for me, and we just said yeah because I just want to fight, bro. You know what I mean? I just want to fight. So uh, I at this point in the UFC, everybody's going to be tough. So it doesn't matter who I fight right now. You know the journey has to start somewhere. So I'm ready. All right, so that's crazy. So first of all, let's go back a step. If everything had gone according to plan, how long ago would you have been in the octagon? Probably March. 
I think that we were supposed to originally fight, fight in March. And uh, DC was dealing with some injuries and stuff. And so we didn't know when he was going to fight. So we kind of took a step back. And, and which is okay because at the same time, as it's taken a long time for me to get back in, I'm just getting better as a fighter, you know? I'm still fairly green. So, um, so you know, I, I, I really – I think I made my pro debut, like, right around two years ago. And so I'm still green in the game, and I still have so much to learn. So I'm not – like. Part of me, I'm like, yo, I want to fight. I need to fight. I need to fight. And then part of me, I'm like, yo, it's fine because I'm just getting better. So so I'm okay with it. Are you now worried that as you get better, let's say you go in there and blow the doors off your first opponent. Are you like thinking to yourself, well, if I had this much trouble getting a fight before I even fought in the octagon, what's going to happen after I start beating the brakes off these guys? Yeah, well, that, that's always what, you know, it's, I've thought about that. And, and you see these guys who get, like, fast-tracked to the title and stuff like that. And some guys it works out for, but obviously, it it worked out for them, you know? And, 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 but, like, I'm okay with it. I don't want to be, you know, I said something the other day is, I don't want to be here for a long time, you know? I'm just here for a good time. So, um, <laughs> um, I'm okay if I get that. I, because if I start beating dudes up, only the top guys are going to take the fights with me, right? So, but I'm okay with that. Obviously, I, like I said, you, you know, I'm very confident, and I have a lot to learn and, and, a, and, and, and a lot of experience to get in the octagon. But I truly believe sooner than later I'll be ready for anybody, and, and I, I already think I'm world class. So I'm personally not scared to get in there with anybody. But that's just who I am, and that's who I've always been. And so I, I'm, not, I'm not too concerned, man. I, I want to put this dude away. I want to put him away, and then I want I want to fight right away. I, I want to fight three times this year. So so what that means, it, it, the only way I'm going to do that is if I put this dude away. You know, I can't go in there and get in a, a three-round brawl war with this dude and think I'm going to fight again in two months, you know? Mm. So I'm hoping that I, I knock this dude out and put him away or whatever, knock him out, TKO him, submit him. You know, there's a lot of ways I can finish this dude. So, um I, I want to do that, and then and then I want to I want to fight again right away. So uh, I'm okay. I, I'm okay with fighting the better guys, and hopefully sooner than later. Now, are you trying to follow the Israel Adesanya path? And by that, I mean the following: He was like you, a star athlete in another sport, and he had six fights in 14 months. Now, maybe you're not looking exactly for that, but something like get in there, make a statement, and quickly follow it up. Put a lot of fights under your belt. Is that what you want? Absolutely. Absolutely, man. And I tell people all the time is, uh, you know, I, I competed at a high level for 25 years, you know, and so um, I don't want to do it. I, I you know, I, who knows? Cause I always tell people you never know where you're going to be in 10 years. Um, but I don't want to I, I truly don't want to follow the same path as DC and, and fight till I'm 40. You know what I mean? I, I don't know if I want to fight till I'm 40. So the sooner the better. But I also don't want to go too soon, you know, because. The, the the sticky thing about that is, say, I, say I'm on a four or five fight win streak, and I, you know I come in and I beat a top ten guy, and they wanna they wanna you know fast track me to the title shot or something. Um, say I get beat, you know, say I'm not ready, and then and then what? And then what's next? You know, and then I gotta fight another top five, top seven guy, right? And then say you lose again, right? I mean, there's all these variables. So so whatever happens happens, but um. But I'm not I'm not afraid to, to fight six times in fourteen months. I'm used to having a hundred wrestling matches a year. You know what I mean? And it's not, obviously not the same thing, but but it I always tell people wrestling's actually harder than fighting. So uh, uh I uh I'm okay with fighting. I, I'm okay with fighting six times in fourteen months. I would love that. I would love the money. I would I would love the activity. Um I would love it, man. Tell me why wrestling is harder than fighting. I'm not challenging you. I'm more picking your brain, but give me the case. So, um, in fighting, it's a lot of it's relaxed, right? You're striking. You've got to be relaxed on your feet. And in wrestling, you, you're you relaxed, but it's also when you're engaged with somebody, you are engaging every muscle in your body at once. Right, and so a wrestling match like right now. So these guys are the Pan Am. They wrestled two three-minute rounds, and so that's six minutes. So for six minutes, it's like a six-minute sprint, basically. And in fighting, you know, I found that you can relax and you can back up. In wrestling, you 
can't back up, right? Because you get caught with stalling or passivity. Um, and fighting, you can back up. If you get tired, if you get rocked or something, you can back up. And wrestling, that's looked down upon. So you're always constantly moving forward, and you're constantly engaged. And for a guy like me, like the last like, seven or eight years, I was wrestling um, internationally. So I was wrestling for Team USA, and I was wrestling the best guys in the world. So every single one of my fights, or every single one of my matches, were very, very hard. And training only gets harder as you get older, because in wrestling training, I'm bent over. You know, you're bent over. You know, I'm almost 30 years old. Think about bending over all day, you know? And in a fight, you can stand up and relax. I personally think a guy who's been, who's been there at, at a high level at goal sports, I truly, and, and I, you could probably ask like a guy like Ben Askren or Henry or, or any of these guys that I, I truly, truly think wrestling training is harder than MMA training. Hmm. Now, you said you don't want to be here till you're... It's grueling on your body. I can believe that. You said you don't want to be here till DC, like when you, he's 40. But what if you were getting DC's checks? <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. No, 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 for sure. Don't get me wrong. You know, if I'm getting those checks, I'll, I'll stick around. Absolutely. Uh, I'll stick around for the super fight. And, and you know, if I'm, if I'm defending the title and, and whatnot. But, um, but, but I've already had a lot of competition under my, uh, under my belt, you know. So, so it, it's, uh, I, I'm not, I'm not looking to be a journeyman. And I'm definitely not looking to be one of these guys who are just fighting because they need the money. You know what I mean? So, uh, I, I, it, it, we'll see. You know, like I told if, Ten years ago, if you would have asked me if I was going to be a fighter or fighting the UFC, I would I would have told you hell no. You know, I tell people hell no. I don't want to fight in the UFC because I'm good. I don't want to fight. I just want to coach and and, and and kind of live my life after I'm done competing with wrestling. And this dude DC and my management convinced me to fight. Here I am. So um, I love it though. Don't get me wrong. I love competing. I'm super competitive guy in everything I do. So uh, I love it. I'm super happy with my life, and, and I, I'm just excited to see. I'm so excited for this to happen because there's going to be one or two things that happen to me, it, it, it personally, in, in my debut. You know, I, there, you know, a star is going to rise, which I think is going to happen, which people, all these people that doubt me, oh, you should be a welterweight. Oh, you should fight 155. They'll see. You know, they'll see. Or or, or I do need to fight welterweight or, 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 or consider what I'm doing, and I get beat up or something, you know. There's going to be one or two things. I'm going to win or lose, you know what I mean? And, and we're going to see uh, we're gonna see how that happens, and I'm excited to see because I, I, I think I know what's going to happen. And, and I think I have a lot of support, and I think a lot of people are excited to watch me fight. But I also think I have a lot of naysayers because of my height and stuff like that. But, um, but I have a, a different set of skills that kind of um, – eliminate the height factor so uh i'm not too concerned man i'm excited uh, now for folks who may not know how tall are you dude i'm like five six five six on my best day <laughs> i'm real short so but but so look you know what i was thinking about the other day ah. think about this we're talking about inches right so marcus spreads is like six foot tall okay he's six inches taller than me this is six inches this right here on my fingers you know what I mean? Six inches. It, we're talking about this little bit right here. That's going to be the siding factor of the fight. This right here. I don't think so, man. You know, so I'm not worried about it. Also, I was kind of thinking, like, given that you are a wrestler, and that would—I mean, I'm not saying you can't do anything else, but given that's your background, it's your bread and butter. Doesn't the shorter stature, to a degree, uh, it, if, the, if a guy's got a really good jab, it doesn't help. But if a guy has an ability, you can get inside. You're automatically underneath their hips. It makes lifting and takedowns and getting on their legs actually a little bit easier. Well, what I found is um, when I spar taller guys, they have to lower their levels to me, right? So, so Marcus Perez might be six one, but during the fight he's going to be like five eleven. You know what I mean? Because he's going to bend his knees because he's going to have to, have to, have to respect my takedown. And if he does, then I'll take him down. You know, and that's what a lot of guys find. Even guys I spar in the gym or whatever, they're taller than me. If they don't respect my takedown, I'll just take them down real quick to make them make them respect my takedown. So a lot of guys have to lower their level to me. So no one's really going to be standing up straight up tall, right? So the, no one's going to actually get their exact height. So uh, so that plays a factor too, man. And you know I close distance really well. And and and, and another thing is that I train at one of the best gyms in the world, right? DC is like my best friend. That's like my big brother. And, and you know, I, and I spend time with, with all our best guys, you know, 
Kane. I go to Kane's house, you know, one on one. We're we're in the grass at night, like working on head movement, working on stuff like this. Like I'm I'm getting advice from the best guys that this sport has ever seen. You know, so so if you don't think that they are gonna do their best that they can to prepare me, or that I'm not gonna be prepared for everything, then 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 people are tripping. You know, because because if you think that these guys got here by fluke and they they're not gonna you know, push me in the right direction of, of things I need to do to be successful in this sport. Um, it, uh, it, 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 it's funny to me that people think that, that we don't know what we're doing over here. And all the states discussion, it's always been a discussion. My height has always been a discussion. But even in wrestling, bro, people are naturally shorter in wrestling, but I've wrestled monsters my entire life. Like the biggest men you've ever seen. I mean, just these guys from Russia, you know, from Dagestan, like these absolute monsters of men. I've wrestled, so I, you know, I've wrestled Olympic gold medalists. I've wrestled the best guys in the world. So, and I and I and I do know it's different, but but I, I think that I can correlate a lot of my wrestling uh, um, experience to fighting. And 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 we're we're gonna find out, man. I, like I can sit here and talk all I want, but we're gonna find out. You know, one day on what June twenty second, we'll find out. Now you're dropping to middleweight for this fight, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How's it going? Um, it's fine. You know, I just start, I'm starting early. I did a pre-camp. We kind of had this date, uh, locked in for a little while. We knew, um, I was going to fight. So, so, uh, you know, I've just been switching it up. I've been doing more cardio. I, I've never been much of a cardio guy. Um, but I, I train, I train, like when I spar, I spar very hard. So that's what trains my cardio basically. And we do some other things, but uh, I've been running and, and I kind of learned uh, from some guys and I talked to some nutritionists and stuff like that. It's like, you know, I, I used to think that when I had a run, I had to run really hard. And I'm not built for running at all. So uh, what I've done recently is I've just been kind of easing into running, you know, just real light. And I think that a lot of that is going to help me just easily trim down. And, and uh, you know, I've cut weight my entire life. So I, I know what to do. And I know there's these secrets. And I know I can, you know, uh, Tyler Minton and uh, – sorry, I was getting a call. Uh, okay. Tyler Mitten and um, um, Ian, Ian, Ian Larios, uh, they come out and help us a lot. And they're good guys. And if I ever need to uh, ask them for any advice, you know, Tyler already wrote me up a thing of, of what I need to do and stuff like that. So so I have all the support. I have all the resources to make it. And, um, and it, it's going to go just fine. I actually think at the end of the day I'm going to make the weight a lot easier than I, everyone originally thinks. Could you go to 170? Like, not right now, but I'm saying, like, in your mind, do you think you could do it? I've thought about it. I really have. Um, I've thought about it in the future, and I've thought about if if, if it makes sense for me. But uh, I've always said that if something makes my life, my day-to-day -day life miserable, uh, it'll never be worth any amount of money or any amount of fame or anything like that. So, um you know, I'll have to see if, it, if if I can, you know, it'll never be comfortable. But if I can um, get, get if I think that I can realistically get down to 170 without it absolutely changing everything in my life and my happiness, um, then I'll, then I'll highly consider. But, uh, but we'll see. I, it'll, it'll, it'll make more sense once I've made 185 a few more times, you know, and yeah. see how I feel and see, see what, what realistically, because like I said, what people don't understand, man, if, I, if I'm not watching my weight, I, I easily walk around like 225 pounds. I'm very, very dense and thick. So, um, uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see in the future. It is wild, though, that you have the body type that you do, athletic as it may be, and then on the other side, you've got Adesanya, yeah. like 6'4", 80-inch reach. It's crazy it's right. that the middleweight division has that kind of body variance. I know, and it's crazy. And a lot of people, I said, you know, the biggest downfall I ever get is, yeah, I see on comments, obviously I don't care. Cause, and we talked about this before because I think the MMA community of fans are terrible. But, uh, uh, I, I, uh, you know, I, I get a lot of discrepancy of my height, right? But, like, I train with very tall guys. Like, even my roommate, uh, Luis Pena, he's six foot three, And I spar him all the time. So, I, like I said, man, one thing that is different for me is my world-class takedowns. And it's something that, you know, I, obviously I don't I, – Yo, Yo Romero is a more successful wrestler than I was internationally. But, uh, but you know, I, I just think that I have something to offer that we've never seen. So, um, and like I said, we'll see. You'll see. I have a lot of really, really interesting takedowns, and, and, I, and I finish very well 
and I always have. So um, that's the difference between me is um, like like a guy like Kelvin Gaston, who I, I, I respect very highly. I think he's a stud. But the difference between me and him is I'm getting Gizzy to his butt more than he did because I wrestled at a very high level, and, and, I, and I've learned how to, how to how to maneuver these guys to a finish that, uh, that only 1% of the world has, you know? So, like I said, I think that I have a different set of skills that a lot of people haven't seen, and I think it's going to be interesting, and I'm always going to bring the fight. I'm a fighter at heart, and, um, and I'm very, very competitive. So I think, that, uh, I think that at the end of the day, they're going to love what I have to offer. What happens when Ben Askren wrestles Jordan Burroughs at Beat the Streets? <laughs> um, I, I know both guys personally very well, and I love him, and I love them both. Uh, I love what Ben's bringing to the MMA world, and I respect Jordan Burroughs very highly. I've known him for a long time. And, uh, but it's, it's, uh, and Ben, I don't know if Ben knows this, and I hope he doesn't, he's gonna, I hope he doesn't get mad at you're saying this, but I don't think it's gonna be close. Um, the difference between wrestling at a very high level and and, and 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 how quickly you can stop wrestling at a high level when you transition over to MMA, um, it's it's not going to be close because all JB is working on is his wrestling. And a couple years ago, actually, um, we wrestled in this thing. There's a, there's a pro match. It's called a Flow Pro event. And mm-hmm. Ben has a little brother who's a, who's a national champion as well. Max. And I wrestled Max. Yeah, yeah. I wrestled Max. And, and my buddy Clayton Foster wrestled Ben. We wrestled him right there in Milwaukee in there. So they stopped this kid's tournament, and we had these pro matches. There was like five of them, and I was the co-main, and Ben and Clayton were the main. And and I won, but uh, but Clayton, I mean, I don't know. I don't, he very handedly beat Ben, and that was three or four years ago. And as you get older, your wrestling gets worse. <laughs> it's proven that. <laughs> Now, you're a good friend of D.C. You were recruited by D.C. You train with D.C. Let me ask you this. I'm a merely an observer of D.C., so what I want is t- utterly divorced from knowing the man as personally as you do. I've interacted with him, obviously, but not in that kind of capacity. Yeah. What do you want for him in the last chapter of his career? Do you want him to fight John Jones at heavyweight? Do you want him just to fight Brock Lesnar? As you speak as a friend and training partner, what do you want for him? Uh, here's where I'm going to get myself in trouble because I, I speak very open-mindedly just like I did last time. And I, and I, I always do. And I wear my heart on my sleeve and I, and I think that it's gotten me to where I am today, but, uh, I don't think you should ever worry about a guy like John Jones ever again. And as much as people want to act like he's the greatest, he's a cheat. He's a coward. He's a cheat. He was never, he's never been legal. Even his past couple fights, he keeps failing drug tests. So, so, He's a cheat, and, and he'll never his his legacy will always be tarnished. DC has passed like something like crazy, like 60, 60 You saw the test from when he's wrestling the Olympics. Like he, he's a he, uh, um, you know he's a, he's a clean, fair, hardworking guy, right? And and I want him to fight. I want him to get one more big paycheck and get out because he doesn't need any more. He he submitted his legacy. He's done. He's done things that only a couple people have ever done. Um, you know, he's lost. His only loss is to the biggest fraud in MMA. And so, um, uh, you know, DC's a really good guy, man. And what a lot of people don't see, and people hate on him a lot because of the John Jones thing, is what John, what DC does behind the scenes, is is what makes him who he is. Um, I've never seen. I've never seen a person as selfless as him behind the scenes take care of people um you know we coach kids and 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 we coach the high school team and a lot of people think that it's me just coaching and dc shows up whenever he wants in reality dc is there just as much as me if not more um he's very selfless he he acts you know he acts as if you know he isn't a celebrity all the time he's very humble guy he's very um down-to-earth guy and he's a good dude, man. And all I want out of him is for him is I want him to get one more big fight, hopefully Brock, uh, at heavyweight. I don't think he should ever make himself get down to 205 again. No point. Um, it, I think he should fight this one fight at heavyweight, Brock, and, uh, and get out, man. Finish on top. Not a lot of guys finish on top, you know? Not a lot of guys finish on top by defending their belt. It's and, and very he true. Defended each belt. He defended each belt. And he deserves, he deserves it, man. He deserves to finish on top. And, and obviously I'm biased, but, you know, I'm a 
a realist too. Um, you know, I respect a lot of guys, and and DC, I, I, he's one of the, he's he's a guy I, I respect more than most. So, um, uh, I, I want him to make some more money and get out, bro, and just do some TV and, and whatever he does to make money. Um, you know, he's put a lot of strain. You know, uh, a lot of people don't agree with it, but we train hard at AK. We spar hard a lot. And he spars hard a lot. And uh, he's going to want to spar me hard today. I know he is. But uh, <laughs> but uh, he's, worked, he's, he's worked very hard to get to where he is. So I just hope he makes a lot of money and gets out. Well, I can't wait to see your Octagon debut. Your one at Golden Boy MMA was phenomenal, or at least that fight anyway. Uh, Dur- Duran Wynn takes on Marcus Perez. This will be UFC Fight Night 154, June 22nd at the Bon Secours Wellness Arena in Greenville, South Carolina. Duran, thank you so much for your time in Canada today, man. Can't wait for June. Thanks, Luke, bro. Thanks for having me on, man. Have a good one. There he goes. Uh, very good. Duran Wynn. Interesting to have his perspective. All right, we go from one man who's got a lot to say to another man who's got a big fight coming up on Saturday, Bellator 220, the last leg, so to speak, of the Bellator Welterweight Grand Prix. Not only that, main event, not only that, there's a title fight on the line. Uh, and one half of the co-main event, or the main event joins us now with crystal clear Skype. John Fitch is here. Hi, John. How you doing, Luke? Good, good to be on. Oh, man, look at you. How did you get the Skype? So uh, that's like 1080p, 60 frames a second. Well, I do, uh, I do pretty much the last year I've done daily live streams, uh, I call it a shake break on my YouTube channel, which is John Fitch. So I've got my lights, I've got everything set up. This is where I, I do my, uh, my shake break from. I know. I'm so, I'm like, not a lot of fighters know about, you know, internet connectivity and lighting and audio, but you got it on lock, John. I'm, it's, I'm learning. I'm, le- I'm learning. It's been a learning process this last year. I had the, uh. The, the, the Bell Tour guys were filming and doing stuff this last week, and he helped me a little bit with the lighting setup, so that uh, that helps a lot. Hey, man, you've been a, a guy who's been around the block. We'll talk about the fight in just a second. This will be your second fight in Bell Tour, as I understand it, if, I'm, if memory serves. How has it been so far? Yeah. Good. Been around the block. You call me old. Um, hey, you're a little bit older yeah, than me, and I feel ancient. <laughs> um. Some days with these kids, it makes me feel uh, feels ancient when, you know, you have people telling me, you know, 20 somethings are telling me they used to watch me all the time when they were little kids. <laughs> oh, wow. But uh, yeah, yeah, it, uh, it's been a great experience. Um, I really like being with Bell Tour. Scott Coker does a great job. Uh, they promote well, you know, um, people don't think I'm retired. So that's a great thing to be with a promotion that <laughs> people know you're still fighting. Uh, opportunity to fight San Jose, opportunity to fight for a belt in this tournament. It's all it's all been really good. I've been excited and happy with uh, everything. All right, so let's talk about your task at hand. You've got to fight Rory McDonald. Let's talk about the fight in particular. Um, a lot of different ways to size him up. The way I'd like to start first is he's coming off that loss to Musasi. Will the effects be lasting, or was that somewhat aberrant? I mean, I can't think of that. You know, you can't think, oh, well, you know, my opponent's not going to be 100%. Uh, you want to always train for the best version of your opponent. You want to be training for somebody better than your opponent, actually. So, you know, I don't put those type of things into my mind going into it, going into training. I just focus on me, what I need to do. I pretend that, you know, my opponent's uh, a well-programmed robot, and I have to, I have to defeat it. Nevertheless, he has taken a fair bit of damage. The nose issue is well-publicized. When you think about offense you want to launch, I'm not saying you're thinking to yourself, oh, God, I got to get the nose first and only. It's not what I'm saying. But I guess I'm t- I guess what I'm asking is you must also game plan to an extent around whatever vulnerabilities you detect, the nose being one of them. Uh, that's true. But at the same time, I mean, the nose is on the face. And when you're trying to hit somebody, you're generally trying to hit them in the face. So uh, <laughs> the nose is just kind of going to be there. It's not. It's not like I have to spend a whole lot of extra time targeting, you know, a, a special spot behind his back on his shoulder or something. Um, it's his face. You're going to try to hit it. You're going to try to elbow it anyways. Um, if he has problems with it and there's there's blood in the water, then you know you, you do more work towards that. But you know he's got a lot of things to attack, and uh, I plan on doing my best to uh, to exploit all of his weaknesses. How has he looked in Bellator? Uh, really good, really dominant. Uh, uh, good stand up, good wrestling, good ground. So he's he's been performing well. It's going to be a great challenge. I'm looking forward to it. 
before he fought Musasi, were you thinking to yourself, this is a bad idea? Kind of, just because, you know, Musasi is a high level guy. And anytime you're going up, you know, two guys that are high level and one guy has 15 pounds of muscle on the other guy, you, you, the kind of fight is supposed to look like the way, you know, or it's supposed to look like that in, in my mind. Um, you don't, you don't see too many guys, um, not getting dominated like that. How come some guys go up in weight and it looks that way? Or, um, uh, you know, we saw, for example, uh, Max, Max came that, up against Dustin and it didn't, you know, there was a real power differential and then other guys come up and they just smoke yeah. the other guy at the higher weight class. Uh, well, I think a little bit of it, it has to do with, um, the style of the fight too. You know, uh, Dustin was happy with sitting in the pocket and trading with him. He had, you know, plenty of power, but you know, he didn't, he didn't go in there and big brother him, throw him to the ground and, uh, put him in the kick in the cage and the fence and then, and smash on him. You know, he fought, he fought a sniping war style, you know, powerful sniping, but still sniping style. Um, it's just, it's a little different. I think BJ Penn and Machida back in the day, uh, Machida style is not the kind that, that, throws you on the ground and, and crushes you. You know, he's going to pick at you from a distance. Uh, okay. Is this the hardest fight you, in your judgment? Not merely by virtue of the title, but forget the title. Is this the hardest fight you could have in the quarterfinals of the Welterweight Grand Prix? Um, possibly. I think they're all tough fights. I think everybody brings something special to the table. Uh, I don't think anybody's a pushover. Um, Ed Ruth, Neiman Gracie. Uh, um, you know, I already beat Daly, but uh, MVP, uh, Korshoff, and uh, Lima, they all present their own special problems. Nobody, nobody's a pushover. That's this is a very deep weight class that Bellator has uh, put together, and uh, you're going to have to figure out your ways around the puzzles, and that's that's really exciting. That said, you wouldn't be in this tournament if you weren't trying to win it. So, who are you going to meet on the other side of the bracket? I think there's a good potential of fighting Lima on the other side. Uh, he's looking really good. He's really big. He's strong. I think he might be able to figure out a way to get past MVP, but I can't put, you know, MVP out of it. He'd be a fun fight. And, uh, you know, he's got a lot of athleticism, a lot of explosive power, and you, you never know. He could, he could land something crazy on, uh, on Lima. It could be either one of those guys. Now you're what, 41? Is that right? Forty-one years old. They keep telling me that. <laughs> I don't. You're Forty-one. How do you feel? Keep physically, it. physically uh, I'm a little banged up, but I think uh, mentally I'm 19 still. So um, you know, sometimes you know things hurt, and I don't. Not, I, I don't remember why. And I'm like, oh yeah, I've been I've been doing this for 17 years. Maybe that's maybe that's why. But uh, you know, I've I've had a great career. I'm really happy with everything I've done. I'm I'm planning on putting everything into this tournament, winning this tournament. I think I'll have one more fight in my contract, and we'll see how I feel after that. And I might move up to challenge for an 85 pound belt, and then I'll call it quits. So, how many fights would that be if everything worked out to plan? Uh, including this one, I think four. Still, that's a lot of fighting, man. <laughs> uh, I mean, I got to finish the tournament, so that's at least three. That's true. You know, so and if I'm if I'm coming off this tournament champ uh, and I got money in the bank from 50 cent, um, why not? Why not go? You know, why not go with the uh, the momentum and just try it? What is the worst injury you've had through all these years? And maybe not from a fight itself, maybe just from training. Uh, heartbreak, probably. <laughs> That's a bad one. That's actually legit, man, because that can one. really just that can derail everything. But I guess uh, forget heartbreak yeah. for just a moment. Like uh, had to get sewn up or repaired. Physically, um, you know the the shoulder injury, the shoulder shoulder surgery was probably the worst because at the end of the surgery, the doctor's like, "Oh well, we got in there and uh, it looks like we we misread the diagnosis. You, we didn't actually have to have surgery." And, you know, I, they, they cleaned up the shoulder and made it clean, you know, nicer, but it wasn't necessary. And I still ended up losing nine months of my career. And, uh, yeah, so I, I would say that was the worst possible thing. So what's the worst heartbreak? Uh, man, a combination of, 
you know, I think when I was cut from the UFC, it was heartbreaking. That was, you know, I think that, and it's a tie with, you know, the divorce I've gone through. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to hear about that. Um, uh, yeah. As a child of divorced parents, but I've, I've seen it all. So, you know, you'll, you'll pull through. I'm, yeah. I'm certain about that. Oh, I'm already, you know, pulling through. I'm already in a good place. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a heavy hit and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's losing a relationship you put everything into. I think, you know, putting my life into my fighting career, I think having that, you know, stool pulled out from underneath me was, was devastating and it caused a lot of negative, um, a native, a series of negative actions, uh, you know, kind of in my career there in that slump. And that was a big part of it, uh, getting around the mental pieces of that and putting myself back together and, and, uh, focusing on, on the fighting and why I like fighting and, you know, getting on the things I can control. When you got cut from the UFC, how long did it take before it didn't sting um, the way it always may, may have once stung? Man, a little while. I think uh, it wasn't until after uh, the, um, the, the, the testosterone incident with Polaris. Uh, that I was like, what the hell are you doing? Like, why are you letting this 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 thing that happened dictate your life and affect you in such a way that you would lose yourself like this? And, uh, you know, getting myself back to fighting and why I'm fighting and why this is all important to me and realizing that there are other ways to to get to the places I want to be rather than just fighting in the UFC. Now, when you say the testosterone incident with Paul Harris, this was what, 2015, I think, right? And he uh, shredded it was your... 2014. 14. And he totally shredded, I believe, your knee, if I'm not mistaken, if it wasn't your ankle. I can't quite recall the details. Yeah, uh, it, it didn't... Um, I didn't need any surgery. It partially tore a lot of stuff, but everything held together. Um, you know, but that was, you know, a nine-month suspension, rehab, and a lot of self-reflecting in that time period. So, so what had happened there? Uh, I mean, I guess if you're going to be open about it, had you, had you used testosterone, um, against the rules? Yes, I did. Uh, I've talked about this a lot in my, in my shake breaks last year or so. So I, you know, I've been open about it to the people who've been paying attention for quite a while. Sorry, man. I got a lot of work to do. I can't can't keep up with all of them. I know. I know. I know. Yeah. It's, it's a lot to ask everybody to, to go through. I got like 260 episodes or something up there. So you're not going to go through all of them, but um, yeah. So like I, I fell through a spiral of depression. I was struggling with, you know, my personal family life and finances. I got to a place where, you know, I could, I, you could see other guys around you. I found out about guys who I had fought, uh, who were on TRT, the, the therapeutic exemptions. I, I, uh, I had learned about uh, Vitor Belfort's, testosterone being covered up and him being allowed to compete anyways. Um, there are rumors of other guys that happening to with also. Um, and then I was taking a 70% pay cut, at least 70% pay cut from going from the UFC to, to uh, the World Series of Fighting. So I was thinking, like, why, why am I uh, holding myself to the standard and making less money and my family struggling? You know, just all kinds of excuses, any kind of excuse to rationalize why it was okay to cheat against a cheater like Flores. Um, and I had no idea what I was doing. It was, it was pure comedy. Uh, me trying to use the shit. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, I didn't even grapple that entire training camp because I was so sore from the injections because I was doing something wrong. I'm not even sure what I was doing wrong, but, um, yeah, that, that was probably the stupidest thing and the best thing that ever happened to me. And you still lost. I mean, it didn't really, I'm sure it gave yeah. you some physical benefits, yeah. but in the end, it didn't result in a win. I, I, that's my thing too, is I don't, I don't believe that testosterone really does anything in a weight class sport, except, uh, make you look awesome. I could eat garbage food and look awesome. And, uh, I had the libido of a 19 year old. Uh, but other than that, like I didn't recover better. I wasn't any stronger. I wasn't any faster. Uh, I don't think I was doing enough of it to get those benefits, but it, I think if you do do enough of it, then you put on weight and I'm, I'm not going to benefit from putting on 15 pounds of muscle. I'm not going to be able to get down to the weight class and be strong and be able to compete like that. So, uh, I really didn't feel like it was, I, I really was confused with what people were doing or, you know, cause I was trying to figure this all out online by myself and I'm sure I was probably doing some things wrong, but, um, 
yeah, I don't really see the benefit to it. And I think guys uh, who are using it are using it kind of as a crutch. I think it's not the magic pill everybody thinks it is. Hmm. All right, let's get to this. I'm sure you've seen it. Uh, the fight you're going to be on uh, with Roy McDonald, the main event, Bellator 220, it's going to be on DAZN. I'm a DAZN customer. And Me too. Yeah, very good, very good. Uh, and uh, Faraz Zahabi, the coach of Roy McDonald, he was interviewed for the zone in anticipation of this fight. I have to tell you, he did not have nice things to say about you, and uh, which is okay. Some people don't like certain people. Some people love certain people. But Faraz is typically, I don't. I'll just be honest. I've never heard him talk that way about anybody. He did not. He was very upset with you. Did you hear these comments? And if so, your reaction to them? No, I didn't. People have mentioned me that he said stuff. I don't. I don't care. I don't live my life caring what other people see, say or think. Uh, you're going to go through your life worrying about other people and what they think you're going to be a loser. <laughs> you're not, you're not going to get far. So I, I, I don't care. People can think whatever they want to say. I live my life for me and my family. Uh, but I guess the implication is he thinks you had used for many years. Your, your contention is you had used, but just that one fight for uh, Paul Harris. Yes. Yeah. That's short period of time. I, I, I broke and, uh, I thought I was missing out on something. This will all eventually come out because I've, I've been uh, I've been keeping journals for a long time. Uh, I released my first book this December, and uh, I, I put the journals or they're up for uh, to everybody to read through, um, you know, in the book. So eventually, I'll get I'll get to that time period. It'll take me a while to get to get to those uh, chapters, but uh, it'll come eventually. So if you end up beating Rory, would you shake Faraz's hand? Yeah, I, I, I find I even recognize who he is. I don't pay that much attention to what other people are doing or the sport that much even, you know. I, uh, I'm just starting to get back into watching fights. Uh, when I first started off, I was obsessed and watched every fight. But, like, over the years, it's just something I do now. It's not, it's not even really one of my hobbies. Okay, last thing on this, though. If you had to, and we're just guessing here. I don't know. I've tried to talk to Faraz. Uh, he was unavailable. But it is unusual for him to have that level of venom. Why you? I don't know. Maybe he's scared. He's already creating an excuse for his fighter losing. I don't know. Don't really care. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's talk about some of the fighter efforts that you have been pushing. I'm very curious to hear about yeah. these. Let's start with the Ali Act. Give me an update, please. Um, well, we're we're kind of stuck in the water, waiting for uh, government to get going. You know, we we get set back every time there's chains up or things going on in the government. Um, we're we're going to be talking to some more people coming up pretty soon. Um, yeah, we're just kind of kind of stalled a little bit because we got to get yeah the government wheels turning. We get these things done, and they've got a lot going on right now. So fair to say, not done, but holding pattern. Holding pattern, yeah, it's not not done, and it's not going to be done. I mean, this is basic basic business. Like, why why should a business be controlled by an outside entity the way that fighters are controlled by promoters? Uh, this eventually will be, you know, changed one way or another. It will be changed, uh, whether the government has to force promoters into turning us into employees, which I don't think is going to happen. And I think it's kind of a bad idea for fighters to want that. Um, you know, the turnover rate is just too high. You're not going to get any benefit out of being a part of a union. Uh, that's why we need a, a, an encompassing association. That way you can go from promotion to promotion and still be covered. You can pay your dues and still, still be covered uh, that way. Um, but yeah, it's just it's gonna whether it's two years or twenty years, sooner or later things will change. It's just the, gonna come down to the fighters. It's gonna come down to the fighters standing up and being like, all right, this is enough. I'm a business. I'm the product. I want better. Uh, the political turnover in terms of party control. Obviously, the Republicans still control the Senate. The man who has promoted much of this legislation is uh, Mark Wayne Mullen, who is a Republican himself, although he has reached across the aisle, I think, to uh, one of the Kennedys as yep. well, who also supports this. So in yep. your judgment, this is not going to be a function necessarily of whatever political party is in office because there's enough bipartisan support? There's enough bipartisan support, but there are individual actors who can be in place who can put up roadblocks and make things difficult. Like who? 
Uh, I didn't. I don't have names, but we we couldn't get a vote uh, for our subcommittee hearing because somebody wouldn't bring it up. It was it got buried under a pile of other of other bills, so uh, it just got stalled out. Now we have a new house, new leadership in the house. Uh, we have another opportunity to get it through and get it to the Senate again. All right, so then let's talk about the lawsuit. Now, I'm not sure how much you can say about that, but can you give us an update about where things are happening or what, what's going on? Yeah, right now in the, in the lawsuit, we are about to start the evidentiary hearings, which will happen in, uh, I think, August. So the UFC has their experts that have one story, and then we have our experts that have another story. And then they also are going to talk with, uh, I believe, Joe Silva. So the judge wants to hear uh, firsthand from both sides and, and figure out which side is full of shit. <laughs> now, I'm trying to understand the future here. Let's say both end up being on a path that's pretty successful. Let's say the lawsuit happens first. How does that change? Again, it would depend on whatever ruling or whatever settlement eventually happened. But I'm wondering, what do you envision? Like When you think of the lawsuit and you think of success, what does that look like? I think the biggest thing is sanctioning bodies. Uh, the promoter controlling rank and title is is a conflict of interest. It will always be a conflict of interest, and it will be the source of corruption all the way through the sport. Uh, until there's an independent body that can control titles and take that rank away from the, the promoter and take their ability to, to take and strip titles, their ability to uh, give and hand out interim titles willy-nilly, uh, you know, they have all the control. So they can they can say anybody is a top 10 guy. They can they can take a belt away from anybody. They can pretty much do what they want. And the contracts are take it or leave it because um, if you don't take the contract, they won't give you the title shot. And then you're buried under their promotional agreement. You can't go anywhere else to fight for another high level title in order to uh, maximize your, 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 your value. Uh, we don't have a free market as far as... Uh, um, how much money you can make. Uh, it's, 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 there's a glass ceiling on our earnings. Would a success, let's say it's majorly successful. Would a majorly successful lawsuit invalidate the need for the Ali act? No, I don't think so because you're always going to need the backstop. The Ali act is the backstop, something to back them up against. Look, you cannot do these, these basic things. These basic things are outlawed. They're illegal. You cannot do them. That way, if they do cross that line, you have a chance to do uh, litigation against them. Uh, and that will be a much quicker process than than class action lawsuit. How much do you think the fans care about this stuff? How much should they care? Uh, I mean, they should because it's a human right. It's a human right. It's an American right to be an independent business and be able to choose how you run your business. Uh, there's... You know, I think that's it's capitalism. That's America. You know, if you are an independent person and, and you believe in your own personal freedoms, the fighter should be allowed to do as he chooses. He should be able to uh, pick his own career path. He should be able to take the fights he wants to take. He should be able to fight when he wants to fight, as many times as he wants to fight. And he should have an opportunity to earn market value for what he's doing to his body and his brain. Uh, I kind of uh, think there's... Um, I think it's kind of a, you know, kind of like a sociopath to think, oh, well, we're going to force these fighters to fight when we want them to fight. We're going to force them to fight the style that we want them to fight. We're going to give them injuries and brain damage, and we're not going to give them market share of the revenue they earn. I think you're a sociopath if you think that way. Or have you been at all dismayed with, I, I know you're not pro-unionization, but have you been at all dismayed with the failure of the unionization efforts? And here's what I mean by that. It just seems to me that you might compel Congress to pass this. You might. But that seems like a lot of work. Could take a long time. Lawsuit, same thing. In terms of getting the fighters to think of themselves as a mutual, having a mutual set of interests, that's where the union would most likely bring those to bear. And all those efforts have failed. In other words, that more than anything has shown us that there is real difficulty getting them to think about the big picture here. Do you take any, do you well, agree with that idea? I, I mean, we've said from the beginning that the union idea will not work. There's no leverage. You have zero leverage. Your average UFC fight career is less than one year. Your main event guys, the big money earners, their average career is two and a quarter years. Like who's paying into what and who's going to benefit from that? You have no power. Are you going to go on strike? 
Like you're not even declared as a as an employee yet. If you sign a promotional agreement and then a bout agreement and then go on strike, you'll be sued for breach of contract. You have zero leverage. It's take it or leave it. Uh, we've said from the beginning, and that's why we've butted heads with other people who want to unionize one organization. It's not going to work. You have no leverage. There's no legal backstop. That's why you need the Ali Act. That's why you need the class action lawsuit to say that these things are not allowed. Um, you, you're not going to create a a, uh, uh, a a bargaining agreement. What what leverage do you have to enforce your agreements? Well, if you get certified to be a union, then you could force them to negotiate. That's the idea. By law. I mean, who's by law? Yes, but like with the with the turnover rate so high, like everybody who signs up will be replaced within a year. Yeah, I'm not suggesting it's the best option. Uh, I, I guess what I, here's what I'm trying to get at. It's like you're telling me that they're not doing it because they have considered the merits of these positions. And candidly, I would tell you, I don't know that that's true. Now, I think you have. And many of your colleagues have. But what I guess I'm getting at is there well, seems no, to be something uh, central to their identity the that prevents themselves, them. The fighters themselves, uh, yeah, I think a lot of them are just waiting for something else to happen. They don't want to take the risk because the little bit of money they're making right now is better than not making money. A lot of these people come from not having money. Or if you're fighting in a smaller organization and you're not even making the, the 10 and 10 or the 20 and 20, like you don't want to go back to one and one and not fighting, you know, once every year, once every two years. Like that's scary. Like these guys need uh, some some income. They need a way to feed themselves and their families, and uh, they don't want to take that risk. Like there have been plenty of fighters who've been uh, made examples out of, including myself, including Leslie Smith. You know, you, you, you squeaky the squeaky wheel doesn't get the grease. It's the it's the it's the nail that sticks up gets the hammer. And people understand that, and they would rather just wait and uh, take things the way they are. And then, as you get the younger generation of people coming through, it's like you're trying to reteach them all over again what's going on. They don't, they don't even really get it. There, there's a reason why people who are on their way out start making noise is because it takes you that long to start figuring out how bad you're getting screwed. Hmm, that's actually a really good point. Um, well, I can't wait to see your next fight, John. Bellator 220 Saturday going to be fun old man john fitch out there fighting the youngins right <laughs> old man fitch baby uh well best of luck you don't need it but i really appreciate your time and uh, we'll check in with you periodically because of all your other efforts so thank you so much john really appreciate right. it yeah thanks Luke. really good talking to you man likewise there he goes john fitch okay okay what to do oh uh, here's what we haven't done we have not done any tweets so why don't we do a round of tweets let's do that I got a bunch of Spanish messages on my phone. Uh, let's do it. There's the there's the clock. As soon as that starts going, there it is. All right. What do you think of Habib's criticism towards the UFC for lack of promoting past weekend's event? And also, do you think Russia could become a second Brazil as a home for the UFC in the future? Yeah. Mexico, I remember the time when everyone was like, Mexico is the new Brazil. Yeah, no, it's not. Mm -mm. Russia might be. They have a, it's a, obviously Mexico has a very, very uh, regal past and present in one combative art, but in a combative art that has a relationship to MMA, Sambo, also Olympic wrestling, just a natural crossover, and, and judo as well, although judo has some issues with the, with the MMA community. Uh, it's just a be much better fit, and then the amount of, uh, you know, as we, what do you want to call them, military-aged males who are capable and willing and ready to do this kind of thing. It's much more, uh, it's much more of a, a possibility that they'll be the new Brazil. In terms of the lack of promoting, I don't know exactly what he's referencing because I wasn't in St. Petersburg. It wasn't promoted here, but it didn't need to be. So I'm a little bit unclear about what the problem was. Next. Uh, do you think Alistair Overeem will get another title shot before retirement? Ooh. That's a good question. Um, you know what? I'll say yes. I'll, I'll be on the positive side. I will say yes. How about that? Next. Is the loss to Roxy a major setback for Shevchenko? Yes or no, and why? No, it is not a major setback. It's a setback. That much is clear. That was one of those fights going in. It wasn't just fun because it was Shevchenko versus fan favorite Roxanne Motiferi. If you had watched Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series, Dana White's Tuesday Night Contender Series, you would have noticed that Shevchenko had, she was very physically strong, had a very good clinch, obviously strikes well at range, but had a real... Um, 
just could tell had a much more defensively minded ground game. And Roxanne is a little bit more offensively minded. So you were going to think to yourself, wow, these are, these are, this is going to be an interesting pairing. And of course, Roxy can strike on the feet too. And anything. Um, no, it just tells me that there's just a little bit more seasoning that needs to happen. Remember, uh, her sister lost her, I think either her first or one of her first fights, the Amanda Nunes fight early on the three rounder, um, early in her UFC career and then bounced back. It does show she has some growth that needs to happen, but, and maturation, but no, it's not a major setback. Next. Is Jed Mishu's hot tweets column the best thing in MMA right now? No, it's not. However, Jed is full of crazy opinions, some of which are crazy, crazy, and some of them are like crazy like a fox. Uh, and so it's worth reading. Uh, he had one this past week that was very much worth reading. Next. It's from Jed. Idiot. Uh, why does everyone hate <laughs> Benzema? I don't know. The guy has, what, tw tw either 29 or 30 goals this season in all competitions. He's got, what, how many for Madrid? I think 21 or something. He's got second most in all of La Liga. Now, not in the best competitions at all time. Yeah, and I got, I got D-bag in the back saying Benzema sucks. All I've ever said was that he wasn't having a trash season. He was having a good season, which by any measurement is objectively true. And I've got people being like, no, it doesn't count because he didn't do it against, you know. Ajax when it really mattered the most. Well, that would have been better, but he still had an objectively good season. Not a messy season, but a good one. All right, next. Uh, is Kyoji Horiguchi the best MMA fighter in the world, not under UFC auspices? Um, oof. If not, he's at the very near, near the top of the list, man. He is good. He is a very, very good fighter. Uh, ben Wynn is a good fighter, and he didn't have much for him. So I'd have to think more about that because there could be somebody we don't really know yet. But in terms of like established championship caliber fighters, he's up there. You know, Musasi is is another one too. Next. Ryan Bader too. Uh, with all the MMA talent in the state of Florida, are you surprised by the card they put together for UFC Fort Lauderdale? No. No, I'm not because they used a lot of the other pieces of the Florida talent to go compete on other cards. And they had some injuries, so it was just a weird turn of events how things went. Next. Uh, just curious, relative to how many pay-per-view shows in a year and given how, given the big stars in each sport compete, what do you think has the most viewers or sales, MMA or boxing? Which sport is the most popular as of 2019? That's, um, God, that's a probably boxing. Um, that's hard to say. Boxing has bigger names right now. Can Canelo is a big name, but, um, and obviously some other ones as well. And there's a ton of money being pumped into there, but, you know, they're geographically quite different where they're popular and whatnot. So one more, one more, one more. Uh, do you believe Israel Adesanya versus Robert Whitaker can sell out the stadium in Sydney? Fits 83,000 people, also referred to as Stadium Australia. By themselves, I'm ill equipped to answer that question, but if they put a baller co main event on it, then I do think that they probably could. Um, an Australian person would be much better suited to answer that question, but my hunch is maybe, maybe. I don't think that if it was just those two and then like a nubs card beneath it, I don't think that would get the job done. But those two and then like you got, you know, I don't know, let's think about something. When would they fight? Sometime in the summer or something, fall? Man, if you put like, let's just say you put Habib and Dustin in the co-main there, yeah, that might do it. That might do it, right? I'm just I'm spitballing there. So, all right, I think that is it for us. Going to get going a little bit early today. Wow, for once I don't have to beat feet to the uh, subway stop to make it to my <laughs> my next job. Keep sending those tweets using the hashtag the MMA Hour. Keep calling in 844-866-2468 or email us the MMA Hour at voxmedia.com. We're off next week. I'm going to be a dad. I'll be back in May. And until then, stay frosty, donks.